Come on, each, if each of you at the back could go forward a row, that'd be nice, yeah. And then we've got room for the ones that, for the stragglers that are squeezing in their last meeting and their last bit of networking <laughs> or forcing that uh, first afternoon drink down their neck, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, there's a reason for that, yeah. It's like in Mexico, you, they close all the boozers the night before an election. So it's like we've done the same thing here with, um, with Lee, you know. We don't, want, we don't want anyone being too hosed up before this important <laughs> interview. They could now, do it after, can't they? Yeah, yeah. they could do it after, yeah. you know. Uh, we want a sober, attentive audience. <laughs> now, have a look on the seats. You'll see some really nice Wide Days postcards and pick one of them up and um, put it in your bag or in your pocket and send it to someone um, that didn't make it this year and tell them what a great time you had and uh, then that they should come next year. I thought, gonna, I thought you were going to say, send it to somebody who owes you money. <laughs> yeah, well, you could do that as well. Yeah, just like stick on the letters like you cut them out of a, out of a newspaper. Uh, so I'm going to put my phone on flight mode. And uh, welcome everyone. This is our final, this is our final um, session of the day, in fact, of the conference. And one of the things about working 16 hour days for about three weeks and uh, lose it, almost losing your voice is that the, the payback is that you get to invite someone that you've always wanted to meet and who's um, had a massive influence on you musically um, to your own event. And I have this privilege today with Lee, um, who doesn't realize that he was um, a figure of fascination for my friend Mark and I when we were kids, not only because of his music, but also seeing him on Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> the fact that he had an extra E in his name made him even more exotic. And um, I don't think I've ever done a DJ set, regardless of what type of music I'm playing, without putting on just an illusion, um, even if it's more of a kind of um, guitar-based set, it always has to be in there. So it was great when my friend Archie said to me just before the pandemic, I'm working with Lee John, do you think you could, um, you could maybe have him at your conference? And um, yeah, so now he's here, um, first event back and in person, and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Lee John to Wide Days. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to say this. We're, we spent two hours on the phone, um, was it one Wednesday already. Um, we've had a couple of very long conversations. I wish I was Joe Rogan right now and had three hours to, uh, to chat to you, but we're going to have to sort of try and squeeze it in. And whilst I mentioned imagination, um, the thing to really stress here is that Lee has never stopped. So you're not just uh, imagination, you're also a producer, a co-writer, a songwriter, actor and filmmaker so uh, we've got to try and squeeze all of this stuff into the next 50 minutes so uh, yeah let's let's quickly start with how you got how you started in music what was the start of your your creative life well it started when well first off um, I lived in North London born in Hackney and then got taken from Hackney to America for five years um, which a lot of people don't know. And so I lived in New York and um, my father remarried and his second wife took me to uh, a company called Worldwide Records uh, that were on Broadway. And I got signed to a label, I was about 11. And um, my father heard about it, didn't like what was going on. School, 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 da, 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 da. Anyway, um, and people who were signed to that label were Irene, Ka Irene Cara and Stephanie Mills. I think it was, it was like a whole theatrical thing. But the hunger was in me. And I, uh, at an early age, I was playing violin and piano. Then I came back to be with my mum. And while in school at Highbury Grove, uh, I was, became part of a duo called Russ and Lee. Um, and we went everywhere. We went, you know, we were like the, the Jackson 2 everywhere, all over the bloody place. And, but it was great because we wanted to um, sing, perform, and I was, at that time I was writing, I was writing from a very early age. So 
I remember we went to Eddie Grant Studios in Osbolston Road in Stamford Hill at the time because uh, we knew him. He, there was a magazine called Black Music and he was asking all artists and stuff like that to come down and, you know, we went. And uh, he gave me encouraging words and my sister actually knew him as well. So he gave us encouraging words and, we, and he was very actually influential with me much later as well. Just before Imagination started, I was performing at the Q Club and he came to see me and was, he remember this kid, you know, it was like this. But I was that kind of um, person, I was everywhere. I was, you know, in the club scenes, I was also um, singing with different bands. And anyway, we got Ross and Lee, we went to EMI Records and we were in the reception area and we saw a guy and we said, ah, he looks like a manager. You know, and he said, yes, I am. Um, I'm working with uh, the David Bowie Spiders from Mars because David Bowie had just split up from his group and they said, well, we're going to take on the Spiders of Mars because we don't know what's going to happen with David Bowie. And that was the truth. And so he took the Spiders of Mars and they put all this money in Spiders of Mars, which obviously we know what happened. <laughs> and he said, well, we're looking for some other um, groups and stuff like that. So um, right there in front of everybody in EMI, we auditioned, we sang, and we, we were made up our own songs and stuff. And, uh, and he said, I want to sign you. So we got signed to uh, 57 Wimpole Street, and it was uh, Snaz Records, a subsidiary of EMI. <clears throat> For the first song, we did uh, one of our songs, we wrote One Life to Live, and the A side is called Get Up, part one, part two, written by Dennis Bond, who became a children's writer for TV. And um, it, I think the only hit or any chart it went in was probably in Finsbury Park. <laughs> and, um, but it was a great experience because we had Gonzalez. You remember Gonzalez? Haven't stopped dancing yet. They were the backing group. Um, the bass player, I remember, was Phil Shan, Chen, who played with uh, Rod Stewart subsequently. Del Newman was the producer. He'd done Dinah Ross. He'd done Paul McCartney. We had Thunder Thighs with a background vocalist. Thunder Thighs sang on Lou Reed's, Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side. Had just done it and came onto our, our record. This all happened and I was still in school. <clears throat> so this was... What was it like going to school? You're working with all these... <laughs> did, did people... Were you kind of seen as, a, as the sort of star kid or did you just go into school regularly and then just not I talk about it too much? I was a star, baby. At school, I was a star. <laughs> you know, we were silly. We had our snakeskin shoes, our velvet jackets. We went down to Kings Road. Vivian Westwood had sex. That was the name of her shop. And we bought our velvet jackets and our cowboy things and you know it was really happening it was thriving and on a Saturday I was working at Toppers in Carnaby Street um, and you know but it was fun you know everything was analog of those days so you know I then um, nothing happened with that so I moved on and my sister was part of a, drama, a dramatic uh, theatrical group called the Unora Strong Players so I became part of that um, and she was with, gave, giving my, my pocket money at the time so I had to join it so um, you know and anyway, there was a band, we were doing a musical and uh, there was a band playing in one of the shows we were doing and they took me on and said, look, we'd love you to sing with us, called the Sun Valley Serenaders. And every Sunday or Friday we'd play at the Queen's Hotel in Peckham. And I'd uh, rush up and, 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 you know, from, from Finsbury Park all the way to there. Then we finally had a residency at the George Canning Pub in Brixton. So I would be doing that. And then all of a sudden, someone heard about me and I ended up doing sessions. And I was still in my teens. Um, and I ended up doing some stuff for Elvis Costello's FB Records. I ended up um, doing some stuff for, oh my goodness. I auditioned actually for Sweet Sensation after Marcel King left and I got the job, but I didn't want to do it. So I was doing that, I was a singing waiter. Um, did you not do bingo halls as well? I did. With the Sun Valley Serenades, we did pubs. The best audiences were the bingo halls. So way before Imagination, I was playing to 2,000 people, you know, in between all the 77, 66, 22. But I was learning my trade. I was learning how to be a performer. Eventually, um, there was a guy called Silver Wayne who had an um, a agency. And you, at that time, you went to the back of Melody Maker or New Musical Express or the stage, you know, to auditions. And I was one of those avid people on a Friday looking, seeing, you know. Um, and uh, I found an, uh, this agency was looking for 
backing singers for American groups. And at that time, I looked much younger, so I used to pretend, you know, pretend I'm older. You know, at that time, we all, we all do that. And I ended up working as a um, backing singer for groups like Chairman of the Board, the Delphonics, um, the Velvetettes, of all people. And I would be the, the backing singer for all these groups that were coming in from the States. And so we did all these shows all over on all the bases. Um, and I was still yet 20 yet. I haven't, I haven't did, you, did you get your E-levels then or your O-levels? I had got the, uh, O-levels at that, that time in between that. But remember, it was a different age, you know. Um, my sister encouraged me to make sure that I had a job at the same time because after nothing happened with the, um, the record, it would get up. She said, don't be disappointed, but you need to make sure that you have an education, you can, you know, and you've got some skills, use your skills. So I ended up working uh, as a tax inspector, training. No way, as a tax inspector. Yeah, in Red Lion Street and, um, near Holborn. <laughs> I was doing that. I still did my Saturday job at Toppers, and I was gigging at nights, and then after the gigs, I'd go partying. So did you ever, <laughs> like, investigate anyone? <laughs> no, I was doing all these, the boring work, all the assessments and all that kind of rubbish, but the money was great, you know. It was, <laughs> it was a time of London waiting when you get all this money was coming in, <laughs> so I, I joined at the right time. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so when did imagination come together? Oh, gosh. Um, well, it came through, and one person I have to thank, by that time, I was the kid that was going to all the different record companies. I had done loads of demos and things like that. And I ended up doing a session for Trevor Horn, who at that point, if you know who Trevor Horn is, he worked with Thank You Hollywood, Grace Jones. Um, at that time, his girlfriend was Tina Charles from I Love to Love, you know, that singer, but they were going out. And um, I ended up writing with him and he, and myself wrote a track called Got To Be Good. And it was this huge, big production, huge. And then he went off to do Buggles and I was just left with the tracks, you know, and he became successful, you know, straight away. So I was just left here, oh wow. And then I went to um, Red Bus Records um, and met Morgan Kahn, who was, uh, had the Street Sounds label much later on. And he was the A&R, he was crazy, he was wild. And uh, he was playing me all these different songs and stuff like that and saying, I, if you're gonna sign to my label, I want this kind of sound. And I hadn't played him the Got To Be Good track yet. But then I said, okay, I'm gonna come back and give you a track I think you may like. Played it to him, he loved it. And then they basically said, we want the masters. At that time, I was signed to another management company, Grey Count. I'm surprised I can remember all this. Um, and um, so the deals had to be done and contracts changed and in the meantime the master came and it was sent to America. They wanted to actually get the Earthwood and Fire horns put on the, the record and maybe some American musicians playing and they lost the master. How did it get lost? That's so bizarre. So I was cut in half. I thought I don't trust this company. <laughs> I thought that's the end of my career. Um, because you know, we'd built up so much for, for this. And then in the end, um, they tried to appease me by saying, look, you know, we've got other writers and producers, we'd love you to write with them and stuff we like. Because you know, they'd heard a lot of the songs I was doing. I was writing a lot, I was doing a lot of that. So um, at that point, I thought I was the, the true professional. You know, like, you want me to write with somebody? Okay, who is this? You've lost my tape. You know, I, I don't believe you're a good company, da, da, da. And uh, anyway, this guy came over and he was like, really, you know, if you like the song, if you like this track, you know, um, write something for it, if you, you know, if you feel whatever. And it was Tony Swain who became my producer. So I took it home, put it in my cassette machine. Any of you who know what a cassette machine is? And, uh, and my, my mother had a, 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 actually a, a, a cassette radio. And what I was doing was I was overdubbing my voice on hers and on my cassette and just experimenting. And I sat down on the kitchen table, and I always say it in all my shows, and it's very true, I sat there and I wrote all the lyrics, all the melody, all the harmonies for Body Talk. And then um, Ashley, my bass player at the time, was working in different bands with me. He was also working with me with the American bands. So we had been writing and doing a few things together. So I'd drag him if I was doing something here and there. So I phoned up Morgan and says, book the studio, I've got an idea. And he said, okay, great, went in. And Tony was sitting there and I just controlled the whole session, <laughs> as I do. And um, what you hear was one take of Body Talk 
and we just added the background vocals. And uh, we felt that the bass should be heavier because what was happening on the streets at that time, especially with the DJ culture. And uh, I think from, I recorded it in the ending of 1980. So the launch was, I think, for the DJs about January, February, and it was white labels. So everybody thought, who is this group? Where does it come from? America. They all thought this was from America. And it went smooth sailing until finally they flipped it and told everybody it was imagination. But that came through, the name came through Steve Walsh, who was a DJ. He was working with us and John Lennon was number one at the time. So we kind of wanted a bit of that sort of thing going on. And um, 44 weeks in the chart. Wow. So you kind of went from being the, <clears throat> the backing vocalist and from doing bingo halls to <laughs> suddenly being a pop star. I mean, was there a point where you were like, now I've made it, or where you just kind of had to pinch yourself and go, all right, this is, this is really happening. I think three hit singles later, I kind of, <laughs> when we got to Flashback, and when we went on top of the pops to do Flashback, which was in December, I think, of 81, and Michael Hurl let me do what I wanted to do, come from the floor to come up, and if you watch the flashback, I'm spinning and spinning and what have you and stuff, and they let me creatively do what I want, and by that time, when I thought, wow, we must, some, this is an effect, all the kids in the audience looked like Imagination. They all had the, 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 the glitter headbands and they were wearing costumes we wore for In and Out of Love and Body Talk. So everyone was looking like Imagination. And for a black British band, that was very unique because you had not had that, we, you'd never seen it before. I was looking at the real thing, hot chocolate, um, candidate, high tension but it never lasted long. And for me, we wanted to sustain. <clears throat> and what was very good about our company was they made us work all over Europe and promote. We went in a little Citroen car and promoted all in Italy. We promoted all in um, France. Well, like a two CV. Yeah, it was like, we had my, it was crazy. Like for the young ones amongst you, these were probably the unsafest cars on the road. <laughs> and um, it, you still see them occasionally, but it was just like the cheapest car you could get. <laughs> and probably the most, yeah, the really most dangerous car you could get in Europe. And, and this, that's what we were in. Wow. I had my cassette, my Panasonic cassette machine everywhere I went with all my cassette tapes. You know, and that's what kept me alive. And we went to every radio station, and they said to us at the time, by the time you get back to Paris, or the main city, everybody will know you, and it was true. And even when things would dry up here, you'd sustain in all these, in all these territories, and it's, it's true. I was just at the Olympia last week in Paris, sold out show, so, you know, 40 years later, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because one of the things that, you know, in the course of my research, which I um, and presumably didn't do this in a 2CV, but maybe in a Dacia or something or a Lada, but you, you seem to have played everywhere. And I mean, I think that it's, I once had dinner with the Scorpions um, in a, you know, rather interesting sort of uh, se sequence of events. And, you know, the only artists that I've known that seem to have played in so many places is them. And, you know, mentioning Lee John and the Scorpions in the same breath is, <laughs> might seem a bit odd, but we can come back to the, it not being that odd in a little bit. But the, the interesting um, thing with this is that, I mean, you did six weeks in the Soviet Union, oh. um, which also the Scorpions uh, did played there. Yeah, there's a conspiracy that they were all, it was all part of a CIA plot, yeah? Uh -huh. We had was an that, exchange. Was that with you, or? No, we did an exchange with the Bolshoi Ballet. Right. The Bolshoi came over here, and we went over there. Wow, so Bolshoi Ballet exchange with, with you as yes. Lee John, or as Imagination? As Imagination, Imagination featuring Lee John. We went there, and we played all these huge arenas. Um, we were in Moscow, we were in, St. Petersburg, it was, what was it called before that? It was um, Leningrad. Leningrad, that's right, yeah. And uh, it was an experience. It was before Pelestreka, so you could imagine. It was, uh, the conditions were, you know, I saw poverty in a level, I mean, they lie, whatever they say, but there were some wonderful things, like we went to the Pushkin Museum and there was art that they all confiscated from all around the world during the war, from the Germans and stuff, all there. But they didn't, you know, it's only, and then in 1990-something, or 2000, I think, sorry, they all said, oh, we've now discovered Rembrandt and all this kind of, but it was all in there. So it was a great experience, and we have traveled 
I mean, South America, and I'm still traveling, but I think that's opened me up to so many different cultures and um, people, individuals, and, you know, and creatively it's, it's given me the chance to work with different people in these different territories. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, in terms of the, the effect on your creativity and your collaborations and your music, I mean, to what extent do those, as those travels and meeting those people influenced your music? Oh, strongly. I mean, I've, I've got a track with um, George Vasilio in South America. I've got a, uh, a track out now with Plastic Bertrand. you hearing with the... Uh, you know, he's very, well, very well known. Um, I've done many, many collaborations, uh, even in America with Arthur Baker, Peter... Uh, Peter um, well, how fine did he say Peter Baker? And uh, um, it's, it's along, along with all of that, it, a lot of this actually you probably hear and see in October, because we've got a 17 album box set coming out. 17 albums? Yeah. Why, that's almost as much as the fall. Well, you know, I've got, I, I did a jazz album as well, remember, which was very, very popular everywhere else except here. And it was a CD DVD done in Rochefort in, in France. And so that's going to be part of the whole collection, as well as unreleased stuff, album tracks, uh, the original versions of songs and loads of 12-inch um, records and stuff like that. Um, this, this, this idea of the, these collaborations, because you did the, the, song, the co-writing panel earlier on, and I mean, you've, you've even jammed with David Coverdale, so um, Lee John, David Coverdale's from Whitesnake. Maybe you can sing a blast <laughs> of Here I Go Again. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, who's been the sort of most... Uh, Unusual, or where you would, or for the audience, you know, with someone the least expected that you've you've Joe done Cocker. something. Joe Cocker. Joe okay. Cocker. Yeah, we were in Germany and we were jamming till, and he he we were jamming till the early hours, and we left him downstairs. And when we came downstairs to do the TV because we were all doing a TV, he was still there. <laughs> you know, he was he was knocking it back. But we had a great time. Jennifer, Jennifer Warns was with us with Joe Cocker. Um, oh God, there's been loads of people that, um, you know, bringing it up to date with my work with the Gorillaz. Um, and uh, there's definitely a lot of collaborations I've done. I've, I've, with Dennis Bavel, we did Police and Thieves, you know, which was my first number one in the reggae chart, which was great. So I've done a lot of diverse things. I've recently done something with um, one of the violin players from Bond. We've done a version of uh, Rimsky Korsakov's Shahrazad, and I've created a new, brand new song out of that. Um, I have a, a couple of songs with um, William Orbit, uh, which I uh, hope will be on his album if, he, if we can find him. But uh, so I've done a lot of diverse things, from dance music to hip hop to R&B to drum and bass. Worked with uh, DJ Fantasy. I'd, it seems every year I work with a DJ of some sort, they always want to do something. You know, I had a garage hit with Mind, Body and Soul. Uh, the Mighty Power of Love was a huge American house track, which became a classic. Um, I mean, this, the house <clears throat> element of it really interests me because I, I checked out quite a lot of the house stuff you'd done in the, the 90s, and I was like, this is really good. <laughs> and, um, it's, you know, it was a, it was a layer to your, your musical past that I hadn't really been aware of. I mean, were you, when you were touring and when you were playing in the 80s and 90s, did you, did you spend a lot of time in these kind of house clubs and in that oh, whole yeah. sort of scene, yeah? Yeah, I mean, we played Paradise Garage in the mid-80s, and it started with um, Larry Levan, who mixed uh, Changes. He did that. And it was like a... Um, 45 minute version, he had reel to reels and he was doing it. And that influenced to do the night dubbing album. The night dubbing album we did was a dub album, which is one of the first albums by a black British group of dubs of all their hits. The only person that done it, I think, was um, Image, uh, not, not um, what they, don't, don't You Love Me Baby, um, Human League. And I think the Thompson Twins had done something, but we had done that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to find that, the night dubbing album. And that was that, when you went to Paradise Garage in America at that time, it was like crazy. And the music was just really pumping. So it gave us the flavor. And our track, Burning Up, of course, became a classic. It was top 10 R&B, um, coupled with So Good, So Right. Um, in actual fact, our very first album, every single track by one was a single and a hit. 
So that was before Illusion or In the Heat of the Night. A lot of people don't even know that. So Good Sarai and Burning Up was the hit, uh, top 10. In and Out of Love was the hit. Flashback was the hit, Burning Up. Um, what's the other one? Body Talk. <laughs> so it was like, I thought that was it. I didn't think anything was going to happen after that. I thought, we've done our off the wall. You know, that's it. And then we did In the Heat of the Night. And that became a hit as well as Illusion and then Changes and Music and Lights. Um, it just, it was mammoth. So we were album selling. Um, and obviously visually, we took it to another level all the way because it was part of the new wave punk, um, Brit funk soul scene that was happening. Everybody dressed differently because people say, oh, your outfits. So it was what was happening in the clubs. We just took it to another level. And remember, outside of London was not seeing what we were doing there. And I was just part of this posse. And we just exaggerated what we did in the clubs and took it to the next level. And the world hadn't seen that. And that was black and British. And it belonged to us. And uh, so everyone else understood it. It was just that to everybody else, oh my God, they're so outrageous, wow, you know, hey. And then they, they started copying it to the points of Vivian Westwood, Catherine Hamlet. They started copying what we were doing and making it more amenable for everybody else. But we didn't get the credit for it, I'll tell you that. I mean, what was it like growing up in, in London at that point? Because, um, you know, the, the levels of racism, I mean, I think a lot of people probably don't even realize that, you know, the police were actively cheering on the National Front um, mm -hmm. when they were marching through London and the, you know, people were dying in custody all the time, all the especially time. you mentioned um, Hackney. I mean, Stoke Newington uh, Police Station was notorious for very, that. Very, very much and, so. I mean, what was it like for you as a, as a young guy when you were growing up in that environment? Well, I talked about being with the Sun Valley of Serenaders performing in Brixton. I lived in Finsbury Park, so I'd come from Brixton to Finsbury Park, get out and walk down Stroud Green, Le Stroud Green Road. And at that time, they had a thing called the Black Mariah, which was like a big van, and it had all the police in there, and they'd be scouting to see any black kids, whatever, on the streets. And it became Dodge, Jodgems, trying to do... I got picked up about eight, nine times. Um, you know, they'd search you to see if you had any drugs on you or anything or knives or what have you. Um, in the end, they got to know it was me, this kid, and because I, I had my plastic bag with my cassette machine in it. And I was walking up the hill to Blythe Mansions where I lived. And they, in the end, they started dropping me home because they saw it was this kid again. But it was, it was frightening because, you know, sometimes if you saw them, I had to dodge through the streets to get home. Um, and it was happening sometimes with my mates. We'd go out to a party and stuff, driving with my mate Leroy Logan, um, portrayed in the uh, Red, White and Blue film. And he'd be driving and we'd get stopped, search the car. Is it just worth mentioning that Leroy Logan was one of the first uh, really senior black police officers, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, one of my best mates. We're still, I'm best man at his wedding and got father to his son. We're very close, uh, like family and um, so, you know, I saw what he went through, but we had two different paths. And it was very funny because when he was training in the um, academy in Hendon, I was living right across the road, my first house, you know, with my first hit record, you know, there I am with a white carpet, all everything. And so I'd go off and do a tour and he'd sneak in with my key, you know, from training and drink up all my champagne. <laughs> An order from next door. We had this Italian rec uh, restaurant, um, La Botte, because they knew, it's Lee on the bring it over to us. So, but we had a great time, so he used to do that. I said, where have you been in my house? You know, have you wrecked my house, breaking my clock? You know, it was great, it was really cool. And I mean, the thing is, I'm gonna mention it now because I think it's, it's one of those things that is a, you know, it has been a, a labor of love and you've been working on it for mm. so long and I don't want to run out of time. <laughs> uh, you know, this is often what happens where you end up in a, go, we go off on a tangent on something and then suddenly it's like two minutes to talk about it. But tell me about the, the documentary uh, flashback. And flashback! Yeah. Absolutely. This is, this is ace as well. It's the first time I've had a panel where there's just like bursts, bursts, of, uh, bursts of vocals to highlight a point. Yeah. So I wrote it, I have to sing it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do I get PRS here for that? Yeah, actually, where's Stuart from PRS? You can answer it? that question. If you're filming. <laughs> now, Flashback um, first started quite a few years ago because I was working with a French uh, co-producer who wanted to do a documentary on, on me. 
And um, I started to contact loads of my friends in the industry, a lot of the black British groups like Light of the World, Central Line, um, Five Star, loads and loads of people. But as we got into it, I found um, it was, they had more interesting stories. And I didn't want it just to be about us, about imagination or me. So I switched it, flipped it. And more and more and more people started getting on, involved and stuff like that. And we first started to um, document the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. And then we started going backwards to the turn of the century, and then forwards to the 90s and 20s. So it was like a whole, heat of, you know, and so much information. And I, I've started doing a lot of research. But in that period of doing flashback, I ended up doing other documentaries. I did three documentaries for SOS Children, one in Zambia, one in Tunisia, another one in South Africa. Um, in actual fact, the one in Zambia, I took my whole band over there and we did some shows for charity. And at the same time, we filmed a documentary about SOS Children and the work that's done there. So it gave me another insight as to what charity work is about and what people do. I saw what they did with Live Aid and Band-Aid and all that, but I wanted to see for myself personally on the ground floor. That's how I am. I want to know the roots of where it starts, what it's all about. So therefore, I know in my heart, it's, I've seen it. You know, we went into the shanty towns, we met families there, the conditions. So therefore, we knew where the money is going. So we did, I did three of those. Um, and then I <clears throat> recently did one called Police and Thieves, which is about the community and people's lives in the community, an ex-gang member, Leroy policeman, and um, a few of my friends who have done really well in, 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 in the businesses and stuff. And in the meantime, I was still doing flashback, you know, because it took, you couldn't always get you know, the different artists to do the interviews with you. So it would be on hold and I'd go back to it, go hold, go back to it. And then in 2019, we got to a level, I thought, okay, yeah. And then I had to go off to St. Lucia, where my parents are from. Any St. Lucians here? I can see one there, another one there. <laughs> and we did a documentary about St. Lucia for, um, it came from my viewpoint, because my parents came from there. And it was great, because normally when you see documentaries about the Caribbean, there's two blondes on the beach, there's a mountain, da 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 da, and that's it. But I want to know about the people, the culture, and also there's a lot of musicians in St. Lucia, and they're doing really well globally, but you wouldn't know, you know, because we're kind of in a little bubble here in the Great Britain. And um, so I, I got all of that on, on, on film, as well as the Prime Minister and um, a few other people. And then um, I went back to flashback. And then as we're getting to a point, we were locked down. So I'm at that point where now we have over 100 interviews. We have, oh, over eight, 900 hours. Um, it's all timelined. So we are looking for some more help with it. So anyone's out there that, you know, thinks they can want to get involved with us to help so us. So what's your top priority, an editor? No, <laughs> not an editor. Money, money, money! <laughs> So, I mean, this sounds more like, when you say documentary, I always think of something that's maybe an hour long or an hour and a half long. This sounds like a whole series. It's an eight-part series. We also have it edited in a, in a rough version for a 90-minute. Um, we have, um, and anyone who wants to be involved in flashback in any capacity has to sign an NDA and speak to Archie over there. He can give you all the SP. You know, he's got the, the, the axe there, the bat, he will, you know. But um, it's been a lifelong journey doing this because what it was, it wasn't just about imagination. I found that there were so many people going back to the 60s, like an Eddie Grant, who I interviewed, like people like Clem Curtis, you know. Um, when I was 10 years old, I, I, I won a competition singing, baby, now that I found you, I can. And that was one of my favorite songs and I'm interviewing him. How was the record industry for a black musician in 1968? So this is what I wanted to get and find out, you know, because that song and Build Me a Buttercup have been in so many different films. So there's so many interesting stories that you don't get or get to see or get to understand. And also, it was a, he was in a multiracial band, like Eddie Grant was. So that was a very interesting, you know, topic. And then we go on to groups like Osabisa and the whole Scar period and Rocksteady and, you know, you come into the period in the 70s with, with when I was a kid, we were going to all these clubs and the club scene. Um, there's a club called Crackers where we all went to. Then you have all the, 
the 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 um the the sound systems of, of that time you know count Sockle and I knew loads of these people so it was something that I wanted to document and it takes you how a lot of the funk groups began so I was part of that journey so I got it from directly from them up into the point of soul to soul I knew Jazzy's family from because I lived in Finsbury Park for years so it was very easy on that extent I found when it came to some of the later artists, you know, the whole industry had changed and the ideals, um, some of them were very false, how they, 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 they signed a lot of the groups, the boy bands and girl bands and stuff, they were put together. So it wasn't the same organicness that we, we came from, where we wanted to go out there and perform as live musicians, which is one of the main things, going out there performing live. That's all I knew, performing live. And things changed drastically due to technology, due to how the industry became. Um, and so the stories I got from mid-90s onwards were very different. Um, but then some things have regressed, in a sense, with, when it comes to British black music. Um, so we're still, there's still bits that I'm, I've got a few interviews I still need to do to tidy it all up and stuff, but I've got some amazing footage and I also own um, a piece of footage which is called, it was This Is My Song, which was a, a song I did, I produced, wrote. It was a period of Band-Aid which we did for Sickle Cell Anemia and uh, art, it was about artists against apartheid as well and we have... <sighs> So many artists on this, you know, from Paul Weller to, God knows, there's just so many people on. It was in um, Trevor Horn's studio in Labrick Grove, and we're all dancing in the street, and it's like a real celebration of all of us. And so that's going to be in the film, because a lot of people haven't seen it since. Uh, but it was very big, ironically, in South Africa. So, because um, I, I was very close with the Mandela's, um, um, especially um, Zinzi, and she was involved with Operation Hunger. And when I first went to South Africa, I became uh, a patron for, South, for Operation Hunger. So she was really into the, the video and what it stood for and would keep me up to date with what was happening, especially in that period of apartheid. So I've had a lot of diverse situations, but one thing that's been very constant is the DJ culture. I'm always being hooked up with all the DJs. They, you know, they were playing me different mixes. Even last week, someone's done a mix of Flashback. You've got um, Dimitri from Paris. Um, you know, David Morales is a very good friend because the first hit he had was Instinctual, which was number one for us in 1988. And that's what put him on the map. So I've had a lot of that. Do you DJ yourself? I have. Yeah, I have. I have, when asked. <laughs> oh, if I'd known, we'd have fast you. Uh, but I do have a Mexican DJ here, so Elias uh, is going to be DJing later on. So, oh, um, okay. yes. He do you DJ know our music? Do you know his music? Yeah, Okay, okay. Um, the, um, the, we'll get you back. Uh, we had Rhoda Daka as our uh, main interviewee a few years ago, and she DJed after. She's a really good DJ. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do, you remember, I came from the period where you had the 45s, and then yeah. you had to put the next 45 on quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, <laughs> that's the, fine. We can sort out and some And the cassette machine. Yeah. You remember that one? I've, still, yeah. I've got two cassette machines in the house, so you could actually do a set yeah, with yeah, two yeah, cassettes. Yeah, you put the headphones yeah. in, and you've got the cassette going in time. <laughs> Um, going just back to the film, I mean, how much money do you think this is, is going to take to actually get the project completed? Um, one of the main factors is clearances. You know, um, we own all the talking heads. Um, but I think we're, it, it sounds a big figure, but it's not. It's nearly close to a million. Um, because that's basically, we feel, with all the clearances, that means the music, that means the publishing, all that kind of stuff. We've spoken to many companies who will help us in that level, but we feel we'd like to get other people involved with us to take this journey to a higher level. But we're not looking just for the UK, we're looking internationally, because this is an international project. Um, we have had a lot of interest from abroad, definitely. They're very keen on it. They want to have it more completed. Um, because I think this is going to stick into... I mean, Flashback for me is not just about the film. It's we've got an app. So you can actually learn about it as an educational... Uh, you can put it into the school so people can learn about British black music. You know, it doesn't mean they're just black. I mean, we've got people like... Um, up here, we've got um, 
Hamish Stewart from the Average White Band. I managed to get an interview with him, you know, and his contribution, you know. Uh, it's not just about musicians in London. We've got the whole Bristol's crew, um, uh, Massive Attack. Um, and, and all the Birmingham bunch from Beverly to Jackie Graham to UB40 to Pass the Duchy on the Left. That's a musical youth. I have to sing the song to remember who it was. And, um, you know, but it's great. It's just a world of, of, of excitement and energy and color and, um, and music makes you feel good. So this, all of this music has influenced the world. Lovers Rock, for example, Janet Kay and Carol Thompson are huge in Japan with Lovers Rock. And, um, you know, I've had more of an international career than I've had here. And that's kept me very stable and very balanced, but also I've watched who has come out of the UK and done very well. With all these things going on, I mean, how do you maintain a focus? I mean, how do you get stuff? <laughs> I mean, obviously, this, the, the documentary is what, you've been working on that since 2009, so I guess that's not quite, uh, quite achieved that maximum focus. But with everything else, the, you know, I mean, you're obviously releasing loads, you're, you're doing so many different things. Those things are being completed or have been completed a bit faster. How do you do it? I mean, do you have a kind of approach to your work where you're, you're very much like, get up in the morning, have a swim, do your qigong, um, and then, then you're straight into it and you're done by 6 p.m.? Or yeah, you... that's exactly it. That's what, exactly what I did, especially in the lockdown. I had a very strong regime, and I've always had that. You know, I think it's discipline for my mom, my sister in particular as well, to have a discipline. So I can still enjoy myself, have a good time, and make sure you get the rest but then I'm enjoying what I'm doing. If I didn't, I wouldn't do it. Um, and I always say, if I can go through the door, maybe I can get other people through as well, because that's the joy of seeing other people come through. Um, and I watch and observe um, people that I've worked with that I've helped come through. You know, at the time, Total Contrast, for example, Delroy, he could have been in imagination, Delroy Murray from Total Contrast. Um, but then I gave them their first studio break because I knew him, and then they got the deal through me pushing and them getting through and did, they did amazing in America so you know I've, I, I like that um, being visual being artistic and you know in every sense whether it be fashion whether it be music you know I like all the different outlets I think sometimes over here in GB they want to compress you never be compressed reach for your dreams go what you want to go for you can do it you know if you can find a way and always believe in yourself and then others will believe in you and i think it's so important that we encourage each other individually collectively and sometimes you don't get that support so sometimes you know especially during the lockdown i was doing some zooms where i was speaking to different artists and just giving them ideas as to how they can do it it's not going to be perfect and the thing is it wasn't just about being a star. It was about being an artist. Because I had my star bit when I was 15, you know, my snakeskin shoes at school, you know. That was my star bit. I thought, oh, we, you know, we're going to be a hit. Oh, yeah, with the Jackson too, you know, <laughs> fantastic. That was great. But then I wanted to learn more about what your craft is all about in the acting, in the writing, um, in the studio. If, you know, in my first, one of the first live gigs I did, um, the musical director said, right, before you come up on this stage, you're going in front of that mixing desk and you are going to mix our sound. And I was like, oh my God. He says, there's no way you're going to sing until you mix that sound. So that's how I learned to, to mix. I know all, I can do all of that. But it was because he said, and until it was right, I wasn't getting up on that stage. How long did it take you to learn? Not that long, not that long, not that long. You know, if you have that, you know, you're young, you've got, your, you've got a young brain, you can do it then. But, you know, it was great, but I became intrigued with that side of technology. Um, I remember when we were in the studio doing the first album, I was like thinking, oh my God, we can't waste the tape. And I collect all the quarter inch tape when we were editing. I'd collect all the tape and reel it back again and, and snip it together and I've got these really crazy mixes of some of our songs but you know that was how my brain was I'm just looking at the time has anyone got I would like, I'm kind of also conscious of the fact that very often with these things I run out of time and then no one can ask a question so is we got if we got a radio mic somewhere just in case has anyone got a question just now Go 
Come on, can you use the mic? Because we're, we're streaming this. So, no, but use the mic, uh, Les, because people who are going to watch this afterwards won't hear it. Uh, thanks, okay. Chief. Sorry, you were talking about a song with the words, uh, Now That I've Found You, I Can't Let You Go. And since you said it, I've been trying to remember the baby, Now That I've Found You, I Can't oh, Let You baby, Go. Baby, yeah. now that I've found you, I can let you go. I build my world around you, I need you so. Baby, even though you don't need me, you don't need me. But, but, but what, what, what's it called? Baby, now that I found you. <laughs> Where are you from? So, if you go on YouTube, what it says on the tin. if you go on YouTube, there's a you can see a duet. I went to Klemko's 70th birthday and sound and sang it with him, so it's on YouTube. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vic, you got a question as well, eh? I've got a three-part question for you. Um, firstly, what do you think of the state of British black music today? Secondly, any favorite artists, British black artists? And thirdly, how do you feel your career and imagination has impacted on the current state of British black music? Very good questions, wow. Uh, the first one was? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't remember either. <laughs> um, Oh, gosh. Uh, Why don't you work backwards? Yeah. Can you I'll remember the third one? Yeah, I can remember the third yeah, one, yeah. Imagination. Um, our impact on British black music, um, especially on the technology, uh, I, Tony Swain, one of my producers, I call him a um, silent genius because what he created in the studio using the synth bass line, and it, it had to do with the Harrison desk and how he EQ'd things. And we did a, a Q and A together, and it was quite interesting. Um, I had a lot of freedom in the studio, a lot of freedom writing. So what you hear, I was not conditioned, I wasn't a puppet, puppet you know. Me, be a puppet, there's no way. So it was a situation where um, we, I knew from an early age, you need to have a sound. Motown had a, had a sound, you know, and I loved that sound. And I felt that we needed to have a sound, or I needed to have a sound to be successful. And um, we understood each other. Someone was writing a lot of the lyrics with Steve, or if I was writing some things with Ashley, we knew we had to, I may sing it really gospelly when we, when we write it, and then I had to thin it down. I had to kind of take some of the frills off of it just to make it right. You know, it's less is more. Um, as far as British artists, there's so many black British artists who I think have done really well. Nowadays, of course, you've got the Emily Sandes. Um, um, oh my goodness, there, there's, um, what's his name again? I've interviewed him. Oh, what's the producer we were talking about earlier? Oh, it was very, very good. Um, oh my God, my brain. My, the gray cells are spinning around here. Um, but they've, there's so many people who've contributed, like Misha Paris and Beverly Knight, who I know, I know them really well. Um, I think there's a lot of people who've contributed who've not being given that, you know. I mean, when you think of Errol Brown and Hot Chocolate, how many hit records they had, and how, you know, oh, you know, I believe in miracles and you sexy thing, and, you know, but it's, it's like it's nothing. And it's contributed, and you know what? Black British music has given, has brought into this country so much money. I mean, I get played every single day in France and all the French territories. And that money goes into the government over here. But they don't mention, I don't mean me, but everyone. It's, a, it's an important factor that British black music has really helped the industry here. And, you know, and it's, it's, not, it's not spoken about. I was going to ask you about this, actually, because I know, appreciate your parents didn't come over on the actual Windrush ship, but mm. it was that, you know, that generation, that era. And... It struck me that the British music industry did absolutely nothing to support um, all these people that had been living here pretty much their whole lives and were being deported to Jamaica, having worked here legally for their entire lives. Mm. Um, and then, you know, with um, as soon as something happens in the States, everyone's kind of going, all right, you know, we'd better be seen to be doing something. I mean, albeit nobly, I'm sure, with reasonable intentions, but... I mean, when you saw what was going on with, uh, with Windrush, I mean, 
how did you feel about that and you know the fact that the British music industry that had benefited so much as well from the contribution of I Am Black artists? It's been a very hard journey because the situation is, I say it all the time, I will go, out, I'll leave like I did last week, I left this country, I get the red carpet, I come back, I get the doormat. So it's been something that we all know within the community that it's been existing for a long time. This is not a revelation. This is what's been happening. So it was great that we can try and be part of the change. And I think it's to let people know we need to change things. So the next generation coming up, because we are a multicultural society. We're a rainbow tribe living together now because, you know, you speak with an accent, so do I. You know what I'm saying? And it's a situation. You go down to London and you're different. Do you know what I'm saying? And we come up here with different. So that's how life is. We're a rainbow tribe of different colors and different creeds. So the situation is, but we're all contributing. And that's the situation is, I think, I'm sounding Scottish then, didn't I? Contributing. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I think basically for me, um, I'm glad I'm in this position at this point in time in my life, but I can try and help. And I think, and, and, and be a, a positive light to those coming, those who have contributed. I think that's the main thing. I think my job has changed, you know, when I first started in the industry. And I think it's bringing us all together to understand how great and how powerful the music that everybody's brought forth. Have you re witnessed much change in attitude in the past two years? And I mean, you're saying that you're still, you know, you're still having to fight for finance for the documentary. And, my, I suppose my, my question uh, would be like, well, if people were so conscious around what's going on, surely they'd be, they'd have come up Jump to you and gone, it, yeah. right, here you go. This is a, this is a story that really needs to be told and, you know, put your money where your mouth is, basically. Well, we had people involved. They really wanted to be part of it. When, when BLM came on, everybody was like, oh, wow, I want to be associated, like it's a new trend. And as soon as uh, it, it died down, so to speak, it became a back burner for them. Oh, we don't have time to do this. Oh, we, let's, can we do it in six months' time? Oh, let's wait till Black History Month. I'm black every day, baby. You know, I don't need to be Black History Month, you know, to just all of a sudden we're doing something for Black History Month. Come on. You know, you're Scottish every day, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's what it's all about, you know. I, they, they, you know, and, and basically the, the media, the systems that we got out there are wrong and they're very bad. And, you know, when you speak out about it, then they want to, you know, push you underneath the, the, the covers. And I think, no, I want to make it a positive light. And, 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 and show to everybody, do you remember this song? Do you remember these people? Da, 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 what have you? Because it's important. And, and because the struggle is like, I'm, seeing, I'm speaking to the younger musicians and they seem to be giving me the same stories, that not much has changed. And the, so the change is very slow. So you have to be independent. I'm feeling like when it was 1979, 1980, when punk came on the scene and the punks emulated the reggae record companies and they started to do independent labels to put out all their stuff. And we looked at that and thought, this is it. They were doing it. They were putting all the punk stuff was going on, independence and what happened. And that was really, really great. And then the record company saw that and thought, oh, you know, we'll buy up these companies and do that. And they've done that now on the digital level, because they've seen people doing it on their small labels and they think, oh, well, we need to get in this world of digital um, records and stuff. And they're doing it that same way so they can buy up and understand the technology. But I think, because I came from an independent label and that's what a lot of people don't. We had a small label, there's probably two other acts on the label, which was great, so we could shine, you know? And then we had a great distribution and good marketing and we had, um, Ollie Smallman, who was prom promoting the records. And I think that's what we have to go back to. Smaller labels, you don't need those big companies. They're just there for the money. Get the money and run. You know, just do it the way you feel you need to do it. So you're in control. So I want to see your documentary. Uh, how can we make this happen? I mean, is it, is, have you thought about crowdfunding it or is there any things where, you know, people that don't necessarily have a million quid, but they've got, they've got a few hundred where well, if you go it could to, help to develop it, yeah. If you go to www.flashbackprojectuk.com, you can, um, there's a email address, you can go there and get in contact with us and we'll show you the route and how to help contribute. Great. Now, I, um, two things, two questions. You've got 
a single out at the moment with Plastic Bertrand, which who everyone should check out. He's a Belgian producer who had a massive sort of pop punk hit in 1978, I think, and then went on to produce John Paul II's record, bizarrely enough. When I was working with Archie here, um, I wrote about this, and um, that's out at the moment. It's, it's got what's well, a radio hit in, in France right now, isn't it? What's uh, what's up? What's on the horizon over the next six months? You mentioned the uh, the box was it 17 album box yeah, set. Yeah, we got the box set. How thick it is 17 albums? It's, is, we've got we've got it vinyl. The, it's um, it's going to be yeah. We're going to have it's on CD. And it's going to be on vinyl. But we're adding things to it. And also last week I recorded a double live album in France, <laughs> as you do. And we have a making of that. And then we have I've done a track with Rob Scott, which is going to come out through. Uh, is Joe here? Um, See, no, 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 they're not here. Um, from Ramrock. It's going to be on Ramrock. Yeah. Oh, really? Great. Yeah, that's going to be with Rob Scott. I've got another track with George or Jorge Vasillo. He's a two-time Grammy Award-winning South American artist, a track called Solitude. And there's some great mixes on it. I've been working with a guy called Dario Caminita. He's an Italian producer, and he's very, very, very good. Um, and, of course, Don't Stop with Plastic Patron. And then I'm working on a solo album. So a lot of those, a lot of some of the ideas I've had for quite a while are going to come to fruition. Um, some tracks that I never put out before will probably be on that. I've got a track called Without Love, which has um, uh, Mo Calamity. She's a, 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 a half African, half French singer. And Paolo Good, who's the son of Grace Jones. And he's really good. So I'm doing some fantastic original different collaborations of different styles and stuff but i'll still still do the odd dance record or what have you because i think you know i've got one there with victor seminelli i forgot about that feels so good that's in the chart now i think yeah in america so i forget some of the things it's the gray cells <laughs> and i always like to ask people is there one question you've never been asked but you wish someone would ask you hmm. do you have one that, you, you, you did think about that, and I thought, oh my goodness. Um, it's a hard one. It's a really hard one. I, you, how I look at life is very different. So when I'm doing interviews with different people, I try and I don't want to repeat the same things all the time. So I try and be a little bit different each time and try and give the audience or the listener something interesting for them to listen to. They may have heard me 3,000 times, but I want to be able to communicate something different. Um, you know, besides people asking me how many E's you have in your name or why do you have so many, you know, and stuff like that. I say it's extra exciting and erotic, depending on the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, or energy, you know. But um, I just think that um, let every moment count as much as you can, especially in these times. It's a very difficult period, but you've got to wake up and see the sun. Even if it's raining, you've got to see the sun. And I think that, you know, our mission now is to encourage each other and really be a major force in what we are all doing here. It's very, very important. And, you know, I, I'm, when I get, I know it's hard, but I'm hearing a lot of the, you know, the mental stress, a lot of that affecting people. And I think sometimes the media pushes it too much. And sometimes it can make you feel you're having these things as well as people do, feeling that. But we need to encourage you know, we should be showing more positive things out there. Well, I don't turn on the news now because every time I turn on, it's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you know. So we need more music in our lives, you know. Or if someone says more music and lights, that's what we need. What an excellent, what an excellent note to end it on, quite literally. Uh, Lee John, thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, we now have to leave the assembly room, so don't leave any stuff behind like my friend Jerome did yesterday to um, find that he had to buy a new phone charger and toothbrush because it closed here at 7 p.m. Where um, there's food and di well dinner up at St. Cecilia's Hall, which is a 15 minute walk from here and we'll, we'll all be heading up there, in fact. Um, Maybe someone could uh, start taking some people up and we'll, um, do you guys know where it is? So see Cairo at the back there, she can uh, start taking you up. It's uh, just on, on Nidri Street in the, above the Cowgate, so um, down from the Scandic, uh, no, Radisson Blue Hotel now. 
Uh, so it's dinner there, and then we're heading up to the liquid room for tonight's showcases. The first four acts are on there. Please come to the showcases because this is um, this is these are the artists that have been um, taking part in our talent development program. And after the liquid room, we're heading down to the caves. So uh, for the last three acts. Everyone who's got a wristband, you could just jump the queue and walk straight in. So, um, yeah, see you, see you at St. Cecilia's Hall, which also houses a musical instrument museum and the largest collection of harpsichords in the world. And it's Scotland's oldest concert hall. And then from there up to the liquid rooms and then back down to the Cowgate of the Caves. So thanks very much for coming. Um, and thanks again to Lee. That was fantastic. Yeah.